everyone again. I have the pleasure of introducing my colleague, Mark Zornada, who is um, uh, Associate Professor in the Department of Horticulture on the Griffin campus. Uh, Dr. Zornada received his uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD from the University of Delaware, Virginia Tech, and Cornell in 89, 95, and 2001. His current responsibilities include all aspects of weed control in ornamentals, small fruits, Christmas trees, and floriculture. His major research interests are in weed biology, invasive weed control, Christmas tree species for the Southeast, natural products as used as herbicides, and anything to do with herbicides, growth regulators, and adjuvants. Welcome, Dr. Zarnata. The floor is yours. Can you see my uh, seminar or my presentation? Yeah, it looks great, Mark. Okay. All right. I'm good to go then. Uh, I guess we can start. Um, anyway, I guess you introduced me. I usually have an introduction slide, but I'm going to be talking about uh, weed control in, uh, in the uh, landscape and nursery. And uh, I don't know how many of you do both, but uh, most people will probably be landscape uh, stint on this uh, talk, but <clears throat> I had to tell you that uh, most of the products that we use, particularly the herbicides, which I get more questions than anything else, uh, they are, you know, over <clears throat> quite a few of the products overlap between the nursery and landscape, and as I get towards the end of the seminar, I'll list everything that all the actives that are out there, and we can, I'll mention a few of them, and <clears throat> Richie, as far as uh, questions and all, I'll see things pop up here, and I can address those, is that correct? Uh, Mark, what we're going to do is we'll be watching those questions coming in for you, Yeah. and uh, Odie and Shemat will be collecting those for you, and we'll go ahead and ask you personally at the end of to, at the end of your session this morning. Okay. All right. And then I should hopefully I'll keep this to about 45 minutes. So I'm going to go fast. So anyway, yeah, so I'll, right. I won't so I won't be disrupt. I won't get interrupted. I guess with questions. Is that correct? Yeah. Don't worry about uh, okay. looking at any of the questions. We'll okay. save it for you. Okay. All right. Well, I'll get started then. Um, right. Anyway, uh, but anyway, th I usually put a slide here. Uh, Bodhi introduced me, but I have. Uh, uh, I've been at Griffin now for 16 years, I think, is what I'm working on. And uh, anyway, as she mentioned, I cover all aspects of uh, ornamental small fruit. I do orchard floor management work now, too, also, and Christmas trees, and of course, flower culture. And uh, she got everything else right. Uh, anyway, before I guess before we start, there's a couple of rudimentary slides I like to go over. So I hope I don't have to bore you too much. But um, a lot of questions you have if you ever had a weed science class or talked about weeds. Uh, one of the things, try to figure out what a weed is. Uh, and of course, the biggest thing is there are plants growing where they're not wanted. <clears throat> but I could list a whole pile of these, uh, probably 30, 40. But, you know, a plant out of place, a plant whose virtues have not yet been discovered is what I like to know or like to say because a lot of plants out there are uh, could be a great ornamental if they were put in the right location or maybe produce a product either medically or for some other use in our society that could be beneficial. So I'm not advocating we should kill all plant material, but when we're trying to control certain things, it, they, uh, plants can be quite uh, difficult to control, and uh, you have to know how to do it, and, and hopefully I'll teach you a little bit about that. But anyway, the re biggest reason I'm here is because plants cause economic loss, and that's why we have uh, six weed scientists on staff here at the university spread out throughout the state. Anyway, uh, so one, I, I've been to a lot, I always ask myself uh, what characteristics make a plant a weed, and I've been to so many seminars, uh, I can't care to tell you. Um, and uh, In fact, I'm in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota this morning at uh, 7 o'clock in the morning. You guys are 8 o'clock, but the uh, I'm here with Bear Chemical. Uh, we're talking about a product that they have, uh, Morango, that you, or Morango or, or Spectacle, you might have heard of, and the uses of it in the landscape and, nur and, the landscape and nursery, not turf, but mainly the <clears throat> the ornamental side of all the product that, that product that active ingredient but anyway uh, but some of the characteristics that make a plant a weed are presence of vegetative structure and that would be you have to think about a yellow nut sedge being that type of plant and uh, 
the plants that produce tubers like that or rhizomes can be really invasive and problematic. Um, and abundant seed production, of course, is always one when plants have viable seed and lose them every fall, if they're adding to the seed bank and they can be dormant for 50 years. So <clears throat> anyway, that can be a, make a plant have a high probability of being a problem. And then, of course, a rapid population establishment, of course, goes along with those other two uh, things I mentioned. And then seed dormancy for long time, long-term survival is also real important because plants only germinate and come up when the conditions are just right. And when they when that happens, usually you'll get some seed germination. And there's and if they don't make it, there's some others behind that, that can cause problems. So even uh, even though you put a herbicide down, for example, a pre-emergent herbicide, it doesn't sterilize the soil or do anything like that. It usually only controls. It, Generally, only close to the top, you know, one inch of of uh, seeds that are actually germinating. Seeds that are in that zone, even where you put the herbicide out, if they're not actively germinating, they will not be affected by the herbicide. Um, anyway, uh, plants that have both the ability to spread reproductively uh, by vegetative reproductive parts and and produce lots of seed, they have really really high problem problematic things that that make them a weed. And of course, uh, when things get uh, torn up, you know, we have a landslide or some major. Uh, uh, weather event, the plants come in first and it's established generally, you stay for quite a while, so they can establish, you know, disturbed sites, and that's usually, you know, a landscape situation when you come in and uh, prepare a bed or plant a, pl plant a few plants around or do some annual planting, you know, usually you'll disturb the site and the plants will germ the weeds will germinate. So anyway, uh, a few of the weeds that we that I show people uh, that we've created that are kind of are ornamental in certain situations, and some people don't think they are anymore at all. But you know, Chinese privet is one where that was actually probably, that's the first ornamental we brought here to the United States. It came from China. Uh, and that we use that for hedging material. Uh, still use it for hedging material, and uh, a lot of people don't sell it anymore. Uh, you can still buy it on the internet, and of course, if you want some, you can come out and dig it out of the, North, the Georgia woods because uh, it's everywhere here in South Georgia, because or in Middle Georgia, uh, because of those nice little fruits that birds love to eat and spread. So. Uh, Anyway, and then of course, uh, creeping a liriope, you know, I get lots of questions where I have to wear two hats where sometimes I'm trying to control weeds in liriope and other times I'm trying to kill liriope, for example, growing in turf grass. And so <clears throat> you have to wear... I have to wear quite a few different hats. And then if you ever planted Hutonia, the chameleon plant, you know, everybody plants that nice little variegated plant here to the left, and about, oh, about uh, two years later, it'll revert back you generally to the to its uh, green form and become very difficult to control. Uh, I get questions on that. I guarantee I'll get four or five questions about that plant every year, and usually in a short time frame in the spring, uh, people want to know how to control it. And, you know, and glyphosate usually is a great answer to that one. Um, I can show you a couple pictures of things that I, we have no answers for. In fact, we were talking about it at this meeting uh, today. Uh, the growers have a lot of problems with it. This is called liverwort. Uh, it's in, generally in propagation houses. It's that little green stuff growing underneath the azalea pot, and <clears throat> there's really no selective product actually to control that. Uh, you can do management methods. There are a few herbicides that once you clean it out, peel it out of the thousands of pots you might have in the greenhouse, you can put a pre-emergent herbicide down and it'll control it. Unfortunately, a lot of the pre's that are labeled for this product are not labeled for greenhouse uses where, where we really need it. And the company I'm with actually uh, bears interest in, in trying to put their product there for controlling this plant. Um, but anyway, it, it utilizes water, uh, can dry the soil out real quick. You start getting a lot more losses of these plants when you're trying to get them up for a container so you, they can sell them to you. Uh, you know, common times I have, you know, I can control weeds in the pot, but you'll get weed seed to grow into where the water comes out in the weep holes of the pot, and you get weeds that are just real common weeds like you see here, cudweed, oxalis, uh, and they're can be very difficult uh, to deal with as, as far as labor is concerned. You know, you could go around the pot and spray it with Dyquat or, or Roundup and take care of that. <clears throat> but that's probably, that's something that there's really no issue. that We have no pre-herbicide to get in the weep holes. Um, I do a lot of work in small fruits. Uh, Blackberry. One of the big problems was yellow and purple nuts edge. Uh, still a problem. We don't we don't have a selective product for that. Uh, <clears throat> you you might be familiar with the product Sandia, or which are in are in the turf. I mean the tea, the turf and ornamental world. It's called uh, Sedge Hammer or or uh, Pro Sedge, but that product works really well at controlling 
uh, yellow and purple nut sedge in this situation. Unfortunately, it's not labeled in blackberry. We recently got a label in blueberry not too many years ago, and it's really helped us a lot. But for example, here you put <clears throat> you put you're putting down six mil plastic, and the and the purple nut sedge will pierce the plastic with no problem. And uh, you know you're going to get reduced yield off of those blue blackberry plants, which uh, I see quite a bit of in South Georgia and blackberry farms. Uh, this is a blueberry situation uh, I worked with. Uh, unfortunately, this fellow had to rip out where, where he had planted these blueberries. And this is uh, the particular weed here is uh, alligator weed. And uh, there was really, there's no selective control. And that's one of the things that I really have to deal with is that <clears throat> you always are wanting to kill the plant uh, or kill the, you know, your weed and then not damage your plant, your desirable plant. And that can be very difficult at times. I always tell people I can kill that weed in there easily, but whether or not the herbicide will have collateral damage on the desirable plant, uh, that can happen a lot of times, and that's why products get labeled and uh, are are labeled for you know certain uh, species of plant material and not others. But unfortunately, there, there's never a silver bullet where, that will kill everything you need it to kill and not damage the plants you want to control. I was spraying five quart rates of glyphosate on this at this size and getting very uh, uh, just a growth regulator response from the alligator weed, and it would it would continue to grow on. Uh, there is a couple products that have come out that, that I've played played around with. One is Drive or Quinclarac, uh, has a little bit of control on this. It works pretty well, and of course Triclopyr. I've always had good activity, but Dow Chemical refuses to label it in uh, in small fruits of where we could use it. Of course, kudzu. This is one I, I uh, know that you lot all of us see. Uh, I I really don't think my personal opinion of this plant is it doesn't come a problem overnight. Uh, generally, it gets to this situation where it's covering up. Uh, there's a southern magnolia tree. This was actually on our campus several years ago. And uh, anyway, it, this like I say, this didn't become a problem overnight. And you know, once it gets to this situation, then people will start complaining. Uh, it can be you could go in and just. Uh, you know, if you go under the the drip line of the tree and cut out where it's going up into the tree just with a machete, uh, you'll kill pretty much all the stuff climbing up into the tree. And then you can use herbicide applications. There's plenty of herbicides we have available to control this plant. Um, I run into a lot of situations where I see this on a 15 degree slope and, you know, on an unmanaged area and people want to control it and they don't really put any thought into what you're going to what you're going to put there after you control the kudzu, uh, you know, it doesn't move around very well at all. Uh, the seed production is extremely poor in this plant. Uh, I've walked 40 acres of this uh, solid kudzu, and you're lucky to find 10 seed pods, and probably of those seed pods, you'll be lucky to find two, three seed that are viable. So, uh, but anyway, usually people don't have trouble controlling this is when they got to write a check out for the, for the herbicide plus the application cost. So, but anyway, there are people out there that will pay uh, that if you look, if you Google the internet and you go through the invasive plant societies in the, your states, uh, they'll usually have people that will actually uh, um, work at, at and and their businesses providing control of weeds like this, and they're pretty good at it. <clears throat> All right, well, when you're in a landscaper or a nursery situation, uh, you're going to encounter weeds, and one of the most important things I could tell you is that you need to. Uh, you need to understand the life cycle of the plant you're trying to control a little bit. Um, generally, I'm pretty good at that, but there's plenty of weeds I get often that I cannot control, or I mean, are I do not know the life cycle of it. So, <clears throat> the first thing you want to know if it's a perennial is that plant coming from seed? Is it coming from a vegetative structure? Uh, you know, and then what plants are is it growing in, and what products are available to me, and what kind of strategy can I use to control these? <clears throat> anyway, if you look to the left, yellow, everybody's pretty very familiar with yellow nut sedge. This plant has very, even though it's flowering now, has very poor uh, seed viability when it produces uh, seed <clears throat> or produces flower. It's less than 5% seed viability, and those seeds have to go through certain dormancy, so it's very unlikely the, the populations of nut sedge that you see are coming from seed. You can get some, but it's very small. So if you're trying to control that with a pre-emergent herbicide, you're probably going to be very unsuccessful because there's very few that, that actually work well at controlling that <clears throat> and from a vegetative structure. But if you get it post-emergently with a product like ProSedge, uh, you can be very successful with it, or even glyphosate, uh, you can be very successful with it. Uh, the product that came out called Freehand, which has dithenamide in it, uh, can control this plant pre fairly well. And uh, FMC has a product called Sulfentrazone that works extremely well at controlling it pre and post also, but it's not found uh, use in uh, ornamental uh, 
ornamentals quite yet. Uh, the plant to the right was we call phylanthus or chamber bitters. There's a whole bunch of species actually of this plant. Um, there's there's probably three four that grow here in Georgia. Um, there's phylanthus norii that looks uh, kind of like a little uh, to me it looks like a little mimosa tree, tiny grill thing just see growing in the turf grass. This particular one uh, is the long stalk phylanthus. Uh, a lot of people confuse it and they call it all kind of things, but chamber bitters is usually called, uh, it's, it's ubiquitous for all the phylanthus species, but if you really look at it, it's, it's not. Um, <clears throat> but there's there's three main species I see in the state, but all of these come from seed, and they all come late in the year, uh, you know, around Ju June, July, you're going to start to do a lot of germination of this, and it's carrying on uh, till you know, probably October here in Georgia, you have to have a pre-emergent herbicide barrier down to control this if you have a severe infestation. And if you don't pull the weeds, <clears throat> you know, the plant out, it's going to produce lots of uh, seed and there'll be problems for years to come. So anyway, <clears throat> I just wanted to let you know that each of these plants require a different control strategy and you got to know your, your uh, what you're trying to control in the life cycle of it. Otherwise, you'll probably be fairly unsuccessful at controlling, what, try, trying to control, you know, your weed problems. So, and one of the things I can tell you that, like, I, I go along with this, particularly with the herbicide use, it's really important that you understand the life cycle of the plant. Uh, it, always try to find out if it's annual, if that plant it, it can be a perennial and come back from seed. Uh, dog fennel is one that I run into, particularly in blueberries, uh, where it will come in as a seed, but then once it's a Establish it's a perennial, and then you know any pre-emergent herbicide there's are worthless, and so anyway, then you're forced to go back to 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 utilize some type of post-emergent herbicide, which there's a very limited arsenal available of post selective post-emergent herbicides for us to use. So you, you really have to concentrate on controlling things pre-emergently, and hopefully I'll beat that into your head uh, through this, uh, the next uh, 30, 45 minutes here. But, you know, just remember an annual completes its growth cycle in a single year. All those plants should be coming from seed. A perennial plant, like I mentioned, it can come from a seed originally, uh, like dog fennel is a perfect example, and uh, and and after the, the the next years after that, it'll be coming from a vegetative structure, and of course, the biennials at some point, you know, it only has a two-year lifespan and it will die no matter what you do, and it comes from seed, uh, has a rosette, but then produces a flower and with lots of other seeds. Uh, could, uh, there's several plants that we have uh, <clears throat> that we deal with, and it depends on what part of the state you're on, but um, uh, wild carrot would be one that's a, would, would be that, and some of the of the uh, cud weeds actually are are biennial. <clears throat> anyway, let's keep going here. Okay, I'm just going to briefly go over the first three, you know, control options we have and uh, and that, that are available to us, and then we're going to talk about chemical weed control, which most of you are probably interested in, and I'll talk about some of the products there and what they do, and hopefully you, you might utilize some of those. Uh, but, you know, physical removal, you know, or hand tillage, uh, that or tillage is mainly used in bed preparation, you know, but hand removal is never going to go away. There's always minimal hand removal, hopefully you have to do, but uh, there's always weed escapes. You, you never get 100% control of everything if you treat large acreage and generally you have if there's just one or two little weeds coming up you can either dig them out or hand remove them depending on whether or not they're deeper to perennials or whatnot but uh if it, it, it's still you know you still can utilize things and then you know and particularly in a nursery industry uh, if you're growing things in a, for example in-ground nursery material if we continue to do this uh, there are machines now that they're developing that actually with uh, uh, lasers and different things that you can uh, it'll identify the plant it's, it, it's looking at and actually just uh, go through and basically mutilate that plant pull it out without bothering the other ones that are in the you know in the actual planting strip so there are type, these type of things that I'll, I, th I think will come along in the future, but but there's still always going to be some type of hand re removal or physical removal. <clears throat> and people are utilizing, there's, you know, fire is one thing that's really utilized in the forest industry for weed control. It's very inexpensive. Herbicides are really expensive. It can be. And if you have, you know, thousands of acres of pine or, or some type of uh, pine or, or hardwoods that you're trying to manage, uh, fire can be a beautiful thing if, as long as it's done correctly and you know what you're doing with it and not damage the trees you're trying to control, I mean, trying to grow. And and then the uh, heat or steam sterilization was a thing that we utilized quite a bit. You know, when we had uh, containers that had soil instead of solus media, uh, you know, steam was a great thing that would eliminate diseases, insects, and most of the weeds. So 
only plant that usually would survive is oxalis. And we're actually going back to that. This was a picture I got from a grower that uh, in high tunnels in Europe that they use. Uh, they're utilizing basically steam sterilization when they're planting like lettuce and things like that. Uh, so you don't have to use any herbicides. So you know, you try to do an organic situation, then he'll come in through. He'll come in here. He he has about a three month period where he can plant uh, annual type plants for you know veg vegetable type plants where he can plant in here and don't have to worry about any weeds or disease before they start you know finally moving in because they'll grow in from the you know if you only treat the top two three inches of the soil they, they always find their way up and uh, will germinate grow but at least it gives you a good window of no weeds where you can grow your plant the desirable plants you're trying to grow and of course uh, you know the little flamethrowers that you can buy at Home Depot and Lowe's you know that they can be utilized for homeowners to or in landscape situations to burn uh, plants out it's can be very difficult to see the flame you can start things on fire so you have to be careful about that and I don't know if I was in California with all the problems they would have whether or not that would be a really good thing to use but it you know heat or you know physical type removals like this are still very popular um, the physical barriers, you know, are the mulches and the and the uh, fabrics that we use, uh, but they're and, but basically what you're trying to do is smother the plant. Uh, and there there's lots of synthetic fabrics that allow air and water to pass. Uh, Dewitt is the company that's pretty much uh, provides most of the uh, fabrics that are out there that are meant for landscape situations that weren't. Uh, developed from other materials. They actually did research, decided what products work well, and then try to develop those for our industry, the landscape and nursery industry. And uh, they work quite well. Uh, they have their uses. I don't like them in the landscape, landscape personally, uh, but if you're in an industrial situation, I think they can be very useful if they're combined with mulches over the top, like uh, river rock or, or some type of uh, hardwood bark mulch that you could come in and refresh every year, you know, once or twice a year, and uh, they can last quite a bit, quite a long time, you know, over 10 years if not exposed to UV light. And <clears throat> weeds can still penetrate them, particularly when they start to break down. But the whole goal is to smother the seed. It, it, it's unable to germinate underneath that fabric. And it, it's, it's water and nutrients and air still can pass through your desirable plants that, that are growing in that situation. And that's basically what they do. Uh, mulches now, of course, are inorganic or organic mulches like pine needles, bark, you know, wood chips, or and there's uh, river rock and marble chips, lava, all kind of things can be the inorganic mulches. Um, and the, the, I love organic mulches. I can't say more about them. Uh, but if you have something on this, if you have nothing on top of bare soil, you're going to have weed growth. So you have to remember that and you have to make sure that you uh, that, that, that you go through and try to maintain a two to four inch layer of mulch and, and refresh that probably twice a year. And this helps maintain soil temperature, soil moisture. I think it makes the area look quite dressed up and it adds organic matter to the soil. And it, it's just a win-win situation uh, until you get the plant material to fill in or where you're gonna you know what what you know what you're covering up with the mulch hopefully you're trying to get other ornamental material in there to try to cover that area and some situations like for growing annuals you know you really don't want that but you're at least coming in with annuals every you know at probably every three four months you're you're coming through with some different type of annual that you're planting you know pansies in the in in the fall and then in the spring you follow it with something you know different like uh, impatience marigolds there's a whole plethora of material out there that people can use as far as biocontrol, I get questions about this. You know, occasionally people want to know about certain things. Uh, but you know, in landscape situation, I've been in nurseries where they use geese. Uh, we get a lot of I get aquatic weed questions occasionally. And if you have small ponds, you know, and you're having a lot of problems with with uh, uh, algae and a whole bunch of aquatic type weeds, you know, grass carp work really well. It's you just put 10 to 15 grass carp per surface acre, and they work wonderfully. Uh, they're kind of the cows of the deep. Uh, they have a fairly good lifespan. Um, and uh, anyway, you can get them off uh, the Georgia. If you just Google them, they're available from many locations here in Georgia. Uh, there's lots of pathogens that are that people have tried to develop. They're very and insects. They're very hard to develop. Uh, the EPA is very uh, hesitant about. Uh, allowing even researchers to utilize them because they're scared of escapes. You know, if you get a plant, an uh, insect or a disease that works on uh, a leguminous weed, you know, what happens when it gets out, particularly in South Georgia, and gets on soybeans and peanuts? That might not be a good ending. Uh, there was all, there was been several products developed. One of the best, most successful ones that was developed between the USDA and the University of Florida was a phytophthora species for controlling strangler vine, which is a terrible problem in citrus, and, and Devine did a really good job of pretty much wiping that out single-handedly. Uh, 
there's goats and sheep people that come in and, and they can if you have unmanaged areas uh, the, they can actually Fort Valley State has a group of a, a guy that will come out release uh, fence in the area that he's trying to you want to eliminate these invasive weeds or release the goats and sheep for uh, basically 24 to 48 hours they'll clean the whole area uh, like you're like the picture is showing and then you can come back and clean the area up with, with herbicides and whatnot and I think it's a good example of where you know you can utilize uh, kind of a biocontrol situation and combine it with chemical weed control and really clean an area up quite quite quickly particularly if you have kudzu uh, lots of vine situations the, these are are quite good at eating just about anything that that you want uh, as far as biocontrol I worked on this for my doctorate degree a little bit and I'll have a couple slides at the end to show you but um, the, the thistle, thistle weevil was really successful uh, you know back in the 90s at l mid to late 90s in the early 2000s but anyway uh, it was. Uh, I'll show you some pictures of it, and then also I worked with a product that called uh, that was a root exudate from sorghum. But uh, you might, we might not see many of these organisms develop, but I think we're going to start plucking out some of the genetical uh, engines of these particular products and utilizing them. Uh, anyway, and, and we had our first bioherbicide virus that was released back in 2014 for the control of tropical soda apple, which is a big weed problem in in. Uh, pasture situations for cattle are moving it all around and that's worked fairly well uh, at controlling that and we really and it prevents us from spraying acres and acres you know the hundred thousands of acres of pastures with herbicides to try to control this plant um, like I mentioned the thistle weevil <clears throat> it was actually if you look back on the previous slide uh, basically what you do is you release these weevils uh, they go and lay eggs on the this the biennial thistle flowers and then the actual uh, Eggs will get out, and or the eggs will hatch, and that little worm, if you can see this, have this cross section of the flower, will get in, eat the the choke out, and then that's pretty much where all the seeds develop. And over time, you know, two to two to four year period, uh, you'll pretty much eliminate the population of any biennial thistles. Um, and you can see here a picture I got from the entomology department that was working on it here. Uh, actually, the fellow was here at the Griffin campus. Uh, you can see 1990 to 1996, I think it is. Uh, the uh, you can see how we got pretty much complete thistle control and there was no herbicides utilized in that field. So it has some uses. Um, the chemical weed control, of course, is our last alternative, uh, usually combined with other control measures like you know, hand weeding, mulches, you know, fabrics. Uh, the products are safe when used properly or they would not get a reg registration. It's so difficult to get a product registered these days. Uh, they were telling us downstairs that they spent about $250 million to get uh, uh, the active ingredient that's in, mor that's in Moran go or spectacle you know get to get that product through and get and be able to sell it here in the United States I always tell people two herbicides had very big impacts on us our, our 2,4-D and atrazine and they simply changed our abilities to produce food forever uh, 2,4-D was the first synthetic uh, or, or you know the first uh, organic or synthetically uh, and the reason I say organic is because it was made out of carbon hydrogen and oxygen but it was the first synthetically manufactured herbicide and then that it, you know eliminated basically broadleaf weeds and, and corn wheat and all our cereal crops and enabled us to double our food production in per acre basis and that was if you could imagine being a farmer in the early early 40s that what that would have meant to you and then atrazine came along in, in the 50s and that enabled us to produce pretty much nothing but corn in fields until we got uh, atrazine resistant weeds uh, we had to shift some gears and try some things but for several years there atrazine was just a wonderful product if you were out west in Iowa trying to grow corn because it again probably doubled your production and then of course with all the advancements in breeding and the other uh, fields uh, like in entomology and uh, uh, pathology you know all these things came together and we're, we're, we're producing from about 20 bushel an acre of corn to over 200 so we're, we're, we're about maxed out in, in my opinion so anyway uh, now, if you weren't listening at all, uh, I'd hopefully you'll listen now because if you're using herbicides, this will hopefully help you. Um, basically, of the herbicides, I try to make this as simple as I can uh, for you to understand in a one-hour seminar. But anyway, uh, herbicides are broken up into pre- and post-emergent herbicides. They're basically the two categories. So pre-emergent herbicides are applied to bare soil mulch before germinate, before the germination of seed, please remember that, uh, and need water to move or activate the herbicide in the seed germination zone. So basically, you'll put down a pre-emergent herbicide if you're familiar with Snapshot, for example, as a granular herbicide. It doesn't matter if you spray it on as a tank mix of treflan and isoxabin or you put it down as a granular. Uh, once that product, once a rainy 
event or an irrigation event happens, you need about a quarter to a half an inch of, of a rain event, hopefully not a gully washer. It'll actually move that herbicide into, oh, you're lucky to move most pre-emergent herbicides into about the top quarter inch of soil where when that seed starts to germinate, it comes in contact with those herbicide molecules and all those herbicide molecules have different modes of action. Some we understand very well, some we do not, but they actually will hinder the growth of that plant, sometimes killing it, sometimes just making the plant will just sit there and do nothing uh, until it's either fro it frosted or you know frost kills it or it, it can't get enough water or a whole bunch of things can happen to it. A post-emergent herbicide are applied any time after the seed has germinated and needs a certain period of dryness after you applied it to the foliage. Good example, a perfect example of that is glyphosate, uh, where if you spray it on the plant and you get a rain immediately after, you're just going to start losing activity. Um, glyphosate has no pre-emergent activity in conventional uses uh, that we use it and uh, it, it it bonds to the soil's particles so tightly and then breaks down there. Uh, it, it really ha it, it has zero uh, pre-emergent activity, but unfortunately most of the herbicides that are pre's or posts kind of can be, uh, for example, atrazine is a good example for us, where in turf grass situations we use that as a post-emergent herbicide. It does have pre-control also, but it can provide post-emergent control of certain weeds. But in a corn situation, you know, if you're using it in, 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 a, in a cereal grain, uh, you know, it doesn't work at all because as a post-emergent herbicide, because most of the weeds there, the particular weeds that we try to control are resistant once they germinate and their, I guess their ability to detoxify the herbicide, that that, assist, that system is up and running in the plant very well and they won't, it won't work at all. So there's a lot of herbicides and it, it kind of flowed in between here, but most of the time they're either designated as a pre or post herbicide for what we do. And then I just wanted to let you know, uh, you know, the herbicides, most people think they leach really badly. Most of the herbicides do not that I deal with. Uh, you're lucky to get them to move in the top uh, half inch of soil. There are some that actually, of course, do move and then, of course, they can be problems, but we usually know about those. And we always know about that they could potentially be a problem and usually growers find out about that uh, after the fact and unfortunately they usually end up in lawsuits. And uh, I occasionally uh, will work as a expert witness and <laughs> it sometimes can be quite lucrative and supplement my salary. Um, Anyway, the two, uh, as, as I mentioned, of the pre and post herbicides, those herbicides can be selective or non-selective. So the selective herbicides are uh, plants, uh, herbicides that are used to control uh, certain groups of plants but are safe on others. And a good example of that would be if a post-emergent herbicide would be 2,4-D. A non-selective herbicide would be a plant that controls all plants they come in contact or if it doesn't kill it, it severely injures it. And a product like that would be glyphosate or Roundup. And in Roundup, the active ingredient is called glyphosate. So, and then as, but those plants can be, uh, there are plants that actually, if you continually apply a herbicide, generally you'll get, uh, you won't kill all the population. There's always some that will survive that are that are either naturally tolerant to it, but as as are the other plants that you killed out or eliminated, these plants start to move in, and those that's what we consider a resistance basically that happens. And uh, you'll see this with glyphosate now, particularly on if you might you might run across mare's tail that's that you can spray glyphosate on it now and it really doesn't control it. And there's lots of plants in South Georgia like palmer amar a lot of amaranth species, the pigweeds are not very well controlled at all by glyphosate. We had to shift to other herbicides to control those. Okay, of the herbicides out there, uh, just some examples of those, uh, you know, a pre-emergent herbicide would be like Preen. Preen you can buy at Home Depot and Lowe's, and that's just Treflan. That's only a pre-emergent herbicide. If, if you spray, use it as a spray on plant material that's uh, just emerging from bud, you can get some damage on the buds, but it generally won't kill the plant. Uh, it'll cause some transient damage to the plant. It'll outgrow it, but it's Preen is Treflan is only a pre-emergent herbicide. It's meant for controlling plants from seed. Post-emergent herbicide, as I mentioned, is like Roundup. Uh, really, it has no pre-emergent activity. only controls things after they've grown. needs a air time period for, for dryness. And, of course, a pre- and post-herbicide would be like Image. And I'm not talking about the product line. I'm talking about the product called Image, which is Mazaquin. And that product can be used both as a pre- and a post-herbicide. Most of the situations we had it for in the landscape industry was for purple nutsedge control back Back in their uh, 90s, when we didn't have uh, San, San, or halosulfuron, which is sold as sedge hammer or pro sedge now. So anyway, and then as far as herbicides, the formulations are created to be applied dry as a granular or as a liquid. And the companies always try to figure out what markets they can sell, th sell things in, and they'll develop the product as need be. And 
you know, dries are developed a lot of times for the containerized nursery industry and the landscape industry. It depends on the situation, but they're a very stable product. They usually put them on biodeck, which is like a ground-up newspaper or a kaolinitic clay, and uh, they always go out at about 100 to 200 pounds per acre, and, uh, and I can tell you that's just the way it's always going to be because that gets good coverage, and as long as they make the granulars the right size, it works great. Sprays always give you better control, and uh, they're cheaper to apply, but you have a much higher degree of potential for damage, particularly if you're doing over-the-top sprays, because the plant itself comes in contact with the herbicide so much more than the granular. The granular falls through to the ground, you might get some dust on the plant material, the, the desirable plant material, but if, if you don't do it on a real dewy day where there's lots of dew, uh, you usually won't have such a problem with damage, and that's one of the reasons that dry formulations you know, can be a little bit better than sprays and, and a lot of times chosen. Um, sprays actually can be made you know, as a liquid or a dry so they can and to combine with water. So they can be in a liquid formulation, you, you, you dilute that in water or a sprayable or a, 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 a dry material that's actually soluble in water. It just depends on the shelf life of the product and how easy it is to get it into that form is what they do and decide as far as the chemical manufacturer. Um, and I get all, lots of names. When, when I first got here, you know, glyphosate was coming off patent uh, back in the early 2000s, and people often would ask me, you know, I found another glyphosate product that works better than Roundup, and it's, you know, half the price. Should I use it? And my answer is, if it works good for you, it, go for it. Uh, all I can tell you is, is that the active ingredient, all I really care about is that active ingredient or common chemical name is glyphosate. If that product tells me it's a four-pound gallon and another product tells me it's a four-pound gallon, I know that you're getting a, that you have the glyphosate molecule there. What it's not telling you is the inactive ingredient, which actually the company knows what's in there and the EPA knows what's in there, but they're proprietary blends and they will only let them spray that product uh, or, or they were only, they, they won't let the public know because all the, all the inner inert ingredients are considered deemed safe, but those inert ingredients can make that product work much better or worse depending on the weed or, you know, it can help penetrate the cuticle a little bit better if it has a different surfactant in, and generally those surfactants cost a little bit more money, or and so you have to take that into consideration too, but if you find a product that works for you and it's cheaper, yeah, by all means, use it. Um, modes of action, I'll just briefly talk about this just for a second. Um, let me see here. The All herbicides have a mode of action or chemical means by which they control plant. And a good example of that is glyphosate. So if you're sitting around a Thanksgiving table next week, you'll know that glyphosate controls the EPSB synthase pathway, which is responsible for the, the production of tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. These are essential amino acids, so they're not, that pathway is not in any animal organism. Uh, it still doesn't mean glyphosate can be detrimental to you, but it's highly unlikely and it's a very uh, environmentally benign product as far as animals are concerned, but as far as plant material, if it's growing and live and growing, glyphosate can be quite detrimental. And, but, and people don't know glyphosate's first registration was for actually a cleaner, is what it was utilized for, is like a soapy cleaner, and then they found discovered it had uh, herbicidal activities in the 60s. So anyway, uh, some plants that have mechanisms which detoxifies the herbicide, and a good example of that is, two, is 2,4-D uh, in grasses. You know, if you spray 2,4-D on grass, you know, it's in a lot of the chemical blends that people that homeowners use. Um, by, uh, broadleaf plants are unable to, buy, to process that the 2,4-D molecule, and it'll it basically causes the plant to grow itself to death, is what we pretty much think. And then uh, plants that are tolerant to it have ways to get rid of it, and they can actually some plants have this ability called NIH shift, where they actually gobble up the molecule and move. It the chlorine groups around on the benzene ring and causing that product to be inactive. And it can also put sugars on it and, and move it around the plant, but it's quite interesting. But, but those are mechanisms of action by the, how the plants detoxify it, and then there's mechanisms of action where the herbicide's trying to control the plant is what I'm trying to, I guess, get across. Um, one of the ones you should know as a landscape person is dinitroanilins, and they include all the colored herbicides that are orange or yellow, and they are penimethylene, sarflan, benefin, pradiamine, and, and you should be familiar with all these, barricade, sarflan, uh, Pendulum are all all these, and these are the colored herbicides. They're used um, uses only as pre-emergent herbicides, and are the real, still the backbone of our industry, as far as uh, what the, what we utilize. But uh, I found out yesterday that uh, uh, that uh, flumioxazine, which is sold at Shore Garden Broadsar to us, are the number one sold herbicide now, and it pushed uh, Snapshot out of the way about two three years ago. But anyway, these products called micro these products called micro 
cause microtubule disruption when the plant's trying to uh, separate uh, or produce a cell, um, the microtubule or the chromosomes double, if you remember mitosis from high school, and then the microtubules grab those chromosomes, pull them apart, and the cell plate's laid down and you have a new cell. What these products do is mess with those microtubules to actually grab the chromosomes and try to pull them apart in two separate portions of the cell before it lays the cell plate down, and they mess that up. The plant's unable to do that, and you get this club rooting effect, which you see in the corn plant. But the one thing you should notice in that corn is that if you get the roots that can puncture down below that zone or that prophylactic layer that you put down, they're able to grow and continue growing as you can see with corn, but these plants would, would, would lodge easily in the field and that's why uh, they're not labeled for corn <laughs> or most grain crops. Anyway, this is a list of all the active ingredients that are available. I could talk to you and bore you to death about all these. But the two big ones now, if you're familiar with our Marango or Spectacle, which is Indazaflam, that's the best product I've ever tested in my life. Uh, it's really good on woody order metals. Uh, I know turf guys are using it to in turf grass. Uh, if you have established woodies, it's really a great product. Uh, Broadstar, which is flumioxazin, uh, and it's also sold under this trade name Shoreguard. It's Broadstar is the granular, and Shoreguard is the scramble formulation. Flumioxazin also a wonderful product, and they're two great rotational products that you can use uh, on woody plant material. And uh, but if you're using, if you're looking for sprays that work real well, that are safer, you know, Surfland combined with uh, Gallery are wonderful combinations, or, or a Gallery combined with Surfland, Pendulum, Barricade, uh, tre Trefland. There's all kind of combination sprays you can do, and then you know, there's other ones you might. Some of the older people, other in the audience, might remember. Ronstar is a great product for controlling, for example, oxalis and bittercress. If you're having problems with that in landscapes, uh, they work wonderful or containers, and I list whether you can use them in the containers or landscape. So the only one you cannot uh, flip flop back and forth is uh, was Broadstar, and uh, and I guess uh, the other one was uh, Curb, which is Pronamide, can't be used in the landscape. So anyway. Okay, uh, the post-emergent herbicides that are available, I had to change my slide last night because I there, there's I forgot that I needed to add certainty in. But anyway, the non-selective herbicides are, you know, Diquad, Finale, Goal, uh, Scythe, and Roundup. And the only one that's in of those non-selective herbicides that's systemic is glyphosate. All the other ones are burned down products. If you have a deep-rooted perennial, lots of rhizosome tubers, highly recommend glyphosate. Um, the broadleaf herbicides, very limited arsenal. That's why I recommend you try to use... Uh, Pre-emergent herbicides to control most of your problems, but Benazon and Sedge and uh, Image, those two products were mainly developed for sedge controls because yellow nut sedge is such a problem. But Basgram would control yellow nut sedge, Image would control purple real well, and that we you can deal with that. And they also control some broadleaf weeds, and so it's not bad. Uh, Clopyrrolate, if you were up north in the northeast, it was a wonderful product for uh, Canada thistle control, which is such a terrible problem for us in the northeast. Uh, if you get it in juniper beds in the landscape, it can be difficult. But but it has a pretty extensive uh, label for landscape ornamentals over the top or post-directed, and it's, it's the only problem is it costs about $120 a quart, but it's great selective herbicide, safe on all major turf grasses, just a wonderful product. Of course, all of you should be familiar with, with Halosulfuron, which is Sedge Hammer or Pro Sedge for uh, sedge control in, in the nursery, and then Certainty came on about two years ago. Uh, it got a label. Uh, for landscape order metals, it's also a fairly good nut sedge product, but we'll control some other weeds post emergently. And then I list Triclopyr in here. Garlon doesn't have a landscape label, so to speak, but you can get by it under the trade name Brush Be Gone and use it for uh, controlling brush uh, or controlling uh, if you cut things, for example, some vines like Smilax or. Uh, or uh, honeysuckle, you can paint it on the vine, and it'll do a very good job of controlling that plant. After you cut the vine, you know the the portion of the plant you cut from the, on the top is going to die, but the portion below, you know, the ground has the potential to reroot. But if you paint this on a fresh cut, it'll work quite well at controlling it. Uh, for example. If you're trying to control English ivy, it's a good choice product for that. If you can't spray it on. Uh, that's the, and then, of course, grass herbicides are clethidin, phenoxyprop, fusillate, and cethoxidim, and they're sold as Envoy Plus, uh, Claim Extra, Fusillate 2, and Segment. Uh, the combo herbicides, these are, are products that usually contain a burn down product and a pre-emergent and uh, easy to f apply and forgetting. All these products are granulars. Yeah, you know, all the granular products out there go from 100 to 200 pounds per acre generally. Uh, and as you can see, most of these products, like, for example, Snapshot used to be the most sold product that, that, 
that's you can utilize that over top of a lot of annuals and whatnot, as a Soxamon and Treflan. But these are pre-mixes, pre-formulated products, so you don't have to worry about combining or mixing things together. Freehand is fairly popular. Biathlon actually is popular. Uh, the Regal products you might be familiar with are excellent products to utilize. Um, this depends on what you're trying to do, but uh, most of those can be used in the landscape and field, as, as uh, I mentioned there. I'll show you. Um, herbicides for annual and perennials, I get lots of questions about this. Uh, the product canceled from Everest is uh, no longer being manufactured, I was informed, but it's still available until they sell the supply out. But that has uh, uh, oxidized and pentamethylene. It, it can be used on a lot of annuals. Snapshot, of course, you know, it's a great product for pansies and a whole bunch of other annual type plants. XL is another one. It's sold under the trade name Amaze and Home Depot and Lowe's. Freehand and Treflan are all products you can use. You have to check the labels out to find out what particular annual are trying to go, but usually it's pansies, and if that's, that's the case, Snapshot and XL are a really good go-to, and Cancel actually can be used too. Uh, some of the tips you might know, Marengo and Spectacle came out, like I mentioned. Uh, the use rate is between 7.5 and 18.5 ounces per product per acre. Unfortunately, it costs about uh, $1,600 a gallon, but most of it's sold in half-gallon containers for about $800. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's 64 ounces, so you can treat quite a few acres with uh, a half-gallon. The Marengo and Spectacle are both in granular formulations. It's about $80, $100 a bag. And Marengo, you can put down from 100 to 400 pounds per acre, and Broadstar is labeled just for 150. But you can utilize these in a nursery and landscape situation. Uh, at least the Marengo, you can. Broadstar uh, still does not have a landscape label. Um, but anyway, safe pre granulars, as I mentioned earlier, they went in for the annual plants or snapshot XL freehand, and all again, one to 200 pounds per acre, which works out to be about five pounds per thousand uh, square feet, roughly. Um, and I mentioned sprays gallery with surfland barricade and pentamethylene are excellent. You know, gallery sold usually in a in a 1.33 pound container, um, and you can utilize that at the highest rate. Of course, is 1.33 pounds. And surfland, I usually recommend two quarts. Barricade is usually one pound if you're using the dry, and it's 21 ounces if you're using the liquid. And pendulum is it can be about 50, 60 ounces usually what I might recommend. Uh, Marengo, I think controls things quite well if you're spraying it at eight ounces an acre. I don't think I think the 18 ounce rate is Weight is too high, and if you use a shore guard for anything uh, or broad star, you know, shore guard I recommend about eight to ten ounces an acre. I've done lots of experiments, and they look quite good. Just some pictures to show you that these herbicide applications do work. You know, I grow a plant like this saber palm in the top uh, slide, put weed control, uh, spray the pots, and see how well they how well they control the weeds. And you can see if you had a weed, weed out an acre of uh, one gallon pots, you'd be you'd be spending quite a bit of money. And uh, same on the bottom with the uh, with the junipers. Um, just some good herbicide philosophies I try to tell people: good weed control does not happen by accident. It takes t it will not last. It takes time. Uh, you never get 100% weed control, as I mentioned. Uh, you always have to use a combination of herbicides. Generally, it's rare to get 100% weed control. And complete weed control visually, where everything looks great, usually requires a well thought out uh, plan and. Uh, and, and the utilize, utilization of several weed control techniques, but you know, pre-emergent and post-emergent herbicides usually fit that, and hopefully you really focus on using pre-herbicides to prevent problems. Um, and we'd like to have a selective post-emergent herbicide for every weed out there. You see it, you treat it. Um, that would be a great thing, but it's not. It's uh, it would be a utopia, and we don't have that. Um, we have very good. Uh, tools for certain situations, but there isn't a uh, product out there that does everything you need it to do. Uh, currently, our best way to control annual weeds is by the use of pre-emergent herbicides. Please try to remember that. Uh, granulars provide poorer control than, than sprays, but are much safer, as I mentioned. And the poorer control is only about 10, 20, maybe 30 percent less control, just because of the coverage ability of the product. It can be difficult to get it where it needs to go, but generally, if you get 80, 90 percent weed control, most people are happy with that. And if you don't hurt your plant material, you're, you're trying that you're trying to grow, then you're happy, even happier. And then, as a, it, it usually costs about one third the, the amount to, to to spray the active ingredient out as it does to put a granular down. Um, some of the errors I say is uh, no rain after a pre-emergent herbicide application. You have to have that rain event in order to activate it within. I like to say it within 72 hours. 
um, a rain after a post-emergent herbicide. I mean, as long as that product dries on the plant, I'm happy. If you're spraying Roundup in a scramble solution and it dries, I'm happy. Poorly calibrated equipment can be a problem. Uh, it, learn how to calibrate your equipment. Ask questions if you don't know how to do it. And leave your ego at home and let somebody explain it to you. Uh, poor choices of herbicides. I've seen people use pre-herbicides trying to control oxalis that's coming from a vegetative structure. That's not going to work. And if you cut the plant material off in a container and expect the pre-herbicide to work on that, it also will not work because that's coming from the vegetative structure or does rebud and grow. And the use of pre-emergent herbicides after most seeds have germinated is always a problem. Um, Field growers and landscapes, if, if you're growing, if you just establish a landscape, I recommend you try to use two to four applications a year. Uh, if you're in containers and you're growing any type of containers for your nursery or your landscape, you need to put out about four to six applications of a, of a pre-emergent herbicide, one of those granular uh, combo products that I mentioned. Uh, with pre-herbicides, try to use at least two different products with two different modes of action. Uh, most of the bags are coming in with a herbicide group on top, and basically you want to make sure the numbers are different. But when you're using the combo products, particularly in the nursery situation, it's not much of a problem because there's already a mixture of modes of action. But what, what I worry about is in the landscape where people just continually use Marengo, you know, it's probably not a good idea. You need to switch to something like Barricade or something else that, that uh, helps, uh, gives you another mode of action and prevents uh, any type of escapes. And then make sure you water, you water after an, a, a pre-herbicide application of some, you know, there's going to be a rain event hopefully within 72, about 72 hours would be great. You know, you can, you can actually spray when, it, when it's raining as long as it's not a gully washer. So anyway. Um, some other ones, uh, at landscape, in landscapes try to maintain a two to four inch layer of mulch, try to refresh it twice a year if you can. And then, uh, uh, and try in landscape situation, you know, once the plants have canopy, you know, pre use of pre-emergent herbicides is not going to be util not going to be necessary anymore. Uh, mainly hand weeding at that point, and then you know, if you have to do a reinstall or or a re you know re uh, refresh of the landscape and rip out some ornamentals, then you have to go back and use pre for a few years until you get coverage again. But if you don't have coverage and you have you know taller plant material and you know it's going to be a, a weed problem, you can always use a pre-herbicide. There's lots available to you. Um, some post-emergent herbicide tips: uh, only spray glyphosate on live growing plant material. You don't you want to control. And I'm going to talk just a slide or two about glyphosate here in a second. I'm almost done. Uh, don't apply glyphosate spray solutions to the trunk of thin trees and bark, and I'll show you why. And then post-emergent applications need to be dry before it rains. So I like the product to dry on. And then glyphosate is our only systemic broad spectrum herbicide still out there. So utilize it. Uh, if you're looking for the MSDSs or labels, I utilize uh, CDMS.net. It's free. It has about 80-90% of all the pesticides that are out there. At Green Book, you got to pay for. I quit using that years ago because I'm too cheap. And then uh, you can get onto the manufacturer's websites too to get labels and MSDS sheets, and they're easily available. And it doesn't take that long to find them now if you have a if you got an internet connection. A lot of people ask me about the herbicide fate. It's just a slide to let you know where all the herbicides go or where the herbicide has potential to go. But I can tell you from all my all my um, knowledge that most of the products either are chemically broken down. Down my, by microbes once they but that's only after they bonded to the clay or organic particles that are on the soil and I always tell people you know they don't like to hear this but less than five percent of the herbicides actually get where they need to go and that and in the plant and actually uh, the molecules actually work on where they're supposed to work because there's so many other places for that molecule to run to be captured and I try to explain to people that soils are such an active matrix and they hold the products can cannot release them uh, a lot of the products uh, the herbicides can get on organic matter on the plant and never get where they need to go. But anyway, though, as I mentioned, the chemical absorption to the clay particles or the, the soil particles and the organic matter, and then the, and then just the breakdown of the chemical naturally or by microbes is usually what happens. That's another reason why you want to rotate chemicals. For example, if you use surfland over and over and over again, you know you'll get uh, ten years from now you'd have hit, instead of it working for twelve weeks, it'll probably only work for six weeks. And the main reason for that example is because the microbes are breaking down that product so quickly. If there's a carbon source in the soil, you know the the microbes are going to use it, utilize that as as food. And then a lot of people want to know about 
half-lives, but it's basically the time it takes from the active ingredient to break down in half. So if you put down a pound of surf lamb, for example, how long does it take to get to a half pound? Uh, here's some good examples, you know, 240s, 10 days, dicamas about 21 to 84, depending on soil types. Clopyrrole is about 40 days. Triclopyr can be 10 to 46 days, depends on, about 10 to 40 days, depends on the soil type. Uh, Sethoxidin is five days. Glyphosate is about 50. Glyphosinate is very quick. It only takes about 10 days till it, it's half It's half in every 10 days until you can't find it anymore. As far as organic herbicides, there's not much out there available. Uh, I've worked with a lot of these products, but the main ones are, are acetic acid, capric acid, clove oil, cinnamon oil, fatty acids, lemon oil, malic acid, strong soaps. Uh, and these are just burned down products. The only pre we have is corn gluten. It has to be put down at two to 3,000 pounds an acre, and it's not really a uh, possibility for most people. Uh, glyphosate, as I mentioned, you know, the pathways for controlling tryptophan, triloxine, tyrosine, phenyl al phenylalanine. We have all kind of resistant crops that are available to us now. And then there's lots of new formulations that will continue to come out. It's been off patent since about 2005, I think was the four was the official date. It's quite confusing to try to figure that out. The concentrations to use when you're just doing a spray or, or a quarter, if you're using a 41% active, a quarter of a percent to 10% solutions is the range. Anything over 10% is wasting product. You don't really get an advantage. But the, a 2% spray, which is about three ounces like per gallon, will kill just about everything. If you have Nuts Edge, uh, Smilax, that's when you start considering privet, when you start considering going to 5 or 10% concentrates. If you're wicking, I usually recommend a 25 to 50% solution. And if you're doing stump treatments, either use a full concentrate or cut it 50 50 with water. Uh, this is what the plant will happen if you spray crepe myrtles continually on the base of the plant. Uh, this particular situation, the fellow will spray on the base of the plant, even though there was no weeds there. Uh, you do that about, you you know, 10 times in a year, and guess what happens the following year when the plant comes out? You get this bud blasting effect, and then they'll ask me how long is this plant going to take to come back, and if anyone's in the nursery industry would look at that and say, it ain't going to come back in any reasonable time, and he had to replace all 50 of these in the parking lot. And this is why you use pre-emergent herbicides and only use glyphosate when you need it. Uh, it's, it's not. And this was, was this the fault of the applicator or the fault of the person that was the boss of the applicator? And I myself would say it's the boss his problem. He's the one that should have been disciplined, and I guess well, he didn't wasn't disciplined, but he learned what to do and corrected the problem. But that was a sublethal dose, I can tell you. It didn't kill the plant, but it's not going to be good. Adjuvants, uh, when you're doing sprays, you, you want to add, you, generally you want to read the label and find out if you need to add an adjuvant. But the only two you really, there's hundreds of these, but there are any uh, spray additives used to enhance the herbicide performance. But the, usually, the two that would be most concerned with are surfactants and crop oils. And surfactants are at, you know, added, at, not included in many formulations, and you need to add them, but they help break water tension. And the crop oils are generally added to the grass herbicides. And uh, they usually break the cuticle down is what we think and allow the herbicide to get in that way. The surfactants actually reduce water tension and help it get through the stomate. And that's where the herbicide enters the, 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 the leaf really well. And that's, of course, on the underside of the leaf. Again, that's why you want to make sure it wets really well. And if you don't have a herbicide, you don't, or a, a, you have that product and don't utilize it, uh, and it, it requires an adjuvant, and you don't utilize it, you can get reductions of control of 40 to 20 to 40 percent. And if you're trying to control uh, vines, you know a lot of times it's not having to weed them out. Always remember, you can do a stump application where you cut the plant and then paint on a herbicide like uh, I mentioned, Triclopyr, which is brush be gone, or Roundup uh, at 100 percent or 50/50 or cut of water, and it does a really good job of controlling stuff, and it prevents you from having to pull stuff out and damage other plant material. Um, uh, just some of the future things that might happen. Uh, I worked uh, for four years on a Lila, or for almost five years on a Lelopathy project with, with uh, I'll show you a picture of it, but a Lelopathy would be an example like black walnuts produce juglone and plants that are in the ericaceous, solanaceous, and, uh, and just about any plant growing around a black walnut doesn't do well because it produces a product called jugulone, which is basically a PS2 inhibitor, and that's really similar to the product atrazine. So you have a product made by nature, jugulone, to atrazine made by us. Um, but one of the things we could do is find a gene, put it in a crop plant or even ornamental and get overexpress that gene and get that plant to make that herbicide for you. And there's all kind of problems with that, but it's kind of a really cool idea. And then uh, to you, and we can also use these phytotoxic products to develop new herbicides uh, in 
sex fungus and bacteria can also give us these type products and will in the future. Um, but it, the product, just a quick slide of what I did for my PhD uh, that was that kind of is applicable here is that basically that what you're seeing to the left are root hairs uh, coming off a of sorghum root, and the right picture is a transmission electron micrograph, which is a fancy slide, but it basically shows you that yellow material oozing out. That's what that black material is. But that product was called Sorgolione. Uh, it actually is produced by sorghum. If you plant sorghum over and over again and try to switch to soybeans, they don't grow very well. And the reason for that was this product that I'm showing you, that black or yellow product that's put into the soil and acts as it's a herbicide and can hurt the plants. Um, Impregnated mulches or thing got released in 2012. These type things you're going to start seeing to come around. Uh, herbicides on the horizon, uh, better herbicide formulation, better vehicles for the herbicide release. Hopefully a slow release herbicide will be developed over the years. I'd love to see that. Targeting weeds with uh, with herbicides. Uh, you know, the, I think the molecular motors will be very popular. They're going to target a particular gene in a plant and then release the herbicide. So only that plant produces that particular gene and only that herbicide will be released when it finds that. With the motor. There's lasers now where they're looking at the plant and making sure it's a weed and then it can be hand-picked by mechanical pickers. So I think those type of things are on the horizon because hand labor is getting so hard to find.